Welcome to the first episode of Liberty Unlocked. I'm your host, Dom Watkins. As someone who values liberty, I've spent a lot of time over the last two decades trying to become better at persuading people of the value of liberty and trying to help others persuade people of the value of liberty. Often, the way I would think about it is, you know, what's stopping me from successfully making the case for freedom? But recently, I've been thinking more about our successful persuasion attempts and what we can learn from those. And that was really the thing that inspired me to create this podcast. So I'd say broadly, my not-so-modest mission is to help the liberty movement become more effective and more impactful. And the main way I want to do that is to talk to people who have had their minds changed in favor of liberty. And along the way, I also want to hear from people who haven't been convinced, people who've been successful persuading, and people who are struggling to be more persuasive. By the way, if you think you fit the bill or want to suggest somebody else as a guest, hit me up at don at donswriting.com and let me know your thoughts. Which leads me to today's guest and the first guest ever on this show, which won't come as a surprise if you read the title. My guest today is Dave Rubin, host of The Rubin Report and author of the new book, Don't Burn This Book. Dave went through a fascinating journey from up-and-coming progressive media figure into someone who calls himself a classical liberal and supports free thought and, broadly speaking, free markets. We talk about that, and along the way, we talk about what liberty supporters need to understand about progressives if they want to be more persuasive, ways Dave aims to make conservatives more pro-liberty, lessons about how to be a more effective communicator that he learned from his friend Jordan Peterson, and a whole lot more. Some final notes. If you want to support the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. Subscribe, whether it's on iTunes or YouTube or wherever you're consuming this. To stay up to date with the show, you can sign up for our email list at donswriting.com, and there you'll also get my week-long Persuasion Bootcamp email course, which is the six skill sets that are really vital to persuasion and things that you can do to help master them. Finally, you can support the show financially by going to libertyunlocked.com and clicking the support button. You'll also find that in the show notes. And every dollar for that goes to improving the show and helping us reach as many people as possible. And now, on to the conversation. Well, thanks for doing this, man. Uh, I remember we met three, maybe three and a half years ago. Um, You know, I had done a lot of radio a lot of tv and i used to always get really nervous and yours was probably the biggest show i had done at that time and i just remember feeling completely relaxed because you had this really mystical ability to turn things into a conversation and show genuine interest which you know usually interviews go one of two ways either the host clearly doesn't care and they're just filling time or even worse they're asking questions where like they know the answer and they're just kind of teeing you up and waiting for you to like smack the ball. And it's just, they're not pleasant to listen to, but they're like way less fun to do. So I'm just curious, first of all, how you even developed your interest in interviewing and your style of interviewing. Or I mean, do you even think of it as interviewing? Yeah. Well, first off, I appreciate the compliment. You know, as you know, this is my garage. So when I do these interviews, at least, uh, you know, until we were doing everything on Skype or Zoom or whatever we're using at this very moment, you know, all, all digitally, uh, you know, I'm, I'm used to sitting across from people in my home. Now, I didn't always do it in my home. I, I did it with Aura TV. We had a studio, then I rented a studio for a while. But for the last, uh, since November of 2016, these interviews have all been done in my home. And I think that in part is just an extension of how I view an interview. If I sit down with someone, if I've gone out of my way to invite you on the show, most likely I think you're doing something interesting. It doesn't mean I think you're right about everything. It doesn't mean I think you're wrong about everything. It doesn't mean I think you're the smartest person in the world or the most witty person in the world or any of those things. But there's some reason that I wanted to sit down with you in the first place. And I'm just a believer of you know, if you sit across from somebody, or in our case, you know, sit across the uh, the digital divide with somebody, if if you grant them the room to kind of be who they are, that you'll get the most out of them. So I don't know where that totally came from. Actually, when I was writing the book, I had to kind of dive into that a little bit more. And I've I've got your book with your on right over here, so I know you know something about this. That when you're writing, you have to 
think about all of the things you're writing about in actually a different way. It, it's very easy for me to talk about all the issues that I care about and that I'm sure we're going to get into in this hour. But when you're putting them in something that you really want to be timeless, not just a video that shoots across the internet or a or an audio podcast that someone listens to and puts down, but something that hopefully that they can go back to that feels relevant, say five years from now or 10 years from now, as relevant as it feels right now, you do have to unpack a little bit about why you are who you are or how you came to those opinions. So I'll just tell you one thing real quick. I mean, one of the things that I did figure out is that my family growing up, I come from New York and I would say I came from a sort of traditional New York liberal household. And when I say liberal, and I mean the good sense of liberalism. I mean the JFK sense of liberalism, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, uh, Ed Koch, what we used to call blue state Democrats, although I came from New York, which was, you know, blue state was thought of as more of a Midwestern type of Democrat. But, but right. liberals who actually believed that the Constitution was good, that America's founding was good, they believed in the Constitution, they didn't want everything to, to, uh, to be about government control of everything. That, was, that used to be a liberal principle. In, in a modern sense, it's not what liberalism is about. And that, in many ways, is, is what I've tried to do over the last couple of years, separate liberalism from leftism. But what I realized growing up was that my family, during holidays, we would battle it out over literally everything. There was no topic that was off the table. People would be eating and yelling at each other and going at it and all that stuff. And then dessert would be served. And then everyone stopped. It really was as simple as that. I never remember an argument, you know, like, like bleeding over into anyone leaving the house angry or anything like that. Like we were just, it was just ingrained in us that you debate all these things. You talk about abortion, you talk about foreign policy, you talk about taxes, whatever it might be, immigration, you talk about all of these things. So I think I just became very okay with hearing ideas that I wasn't in total agreement with. And I didn't really realize it until writing the book that I must have translated that into what I do here. And then the one other piece that I would throw in is that my, my friend and mentor, and as I say in the acknowledgments of the book, bonus grandfather, Larry King, I grew up watching Larry King and I always liked him as an interviewer. He, it, it seemed like he just sat down with people and was curious about them. I always liked that. And you know that's so rare these days, unfortunately, but... I think that's the right way to interview. Now, some people might like a more combative interview. Some people might like some other thing, and that, that's fine too. I, I like what I do. People seem to enjoy it, so it's good. Yeah, and well, that kind of touches on the main reason I wanted to talk today. So the impetus for this podcast was we could learn a lot about how to appeal, make our ideas as people who value liberty and of course, we have lots of debates about what that means. But just generally speaking, as people value liberty, I think we can make a lot better strides towards um, presenting the ideas to other people if we take into account how we were persuaded. And you have one of the most interesting stories because, you know, I talk to a lot of people who, who came from the left in some form, but you're one of the few people I know who it wasn't just like, you know, you spent a few years in high school or college thinking, yeah, those <laughs> ideas sound fine. Like you were very much in the thick of it, had devoted your life to it. How old were you when you kind of started going on this other journey towards, I guess, what you would call today classical liberalism? I mean, I'm, I'm 43 now. I, was, I moved to LA to take a job at the Young Turks, which is a pretty far left, I would say, in essence, socialist YouTube channel using all the tools of capitalism, of course. But I moved in February of 2013. So it really, and then I was there for about two years. So truly, it's only in the last five years. I mean, you can find videos of me five years ago supporting Bernie Sanders. The, the ideas that I know are, are pretty much the worst ideas spreading throughout the West right now. So I think that that's kind of what put me on the map is I was just open about it. I, I really was. I thought, you know, I describe it this way in the book. I thought that progressives were kind of liberals on steroids. Like they were, I sensed that they were liberal and what I meant was sort of open-minded and interested in free speech, that, that sort of liberalism. But they were always yelling. They were always angry. I don't just mean the Young Turks. I mean, just like progressives right. in general. And you can see this with AOC and, you know, these people, there's just this fire and it's like, it's sort of, if you're not really thinking about what they're saying, it sort of seems right because everyone that they're fighting is a racist. Everyone that they're fighting is a bigot and they're hunting Nazis and they're doing these things that seem so morally right. And all of the people against them are so awful. What woke me up to it, I mean, there's, there's three specific instances that I lay out in the book, but 
but the broader sort of spectrum around it was that the equation stopped working for me at some point. Like it didn't seem possible that we could be so great and they could all be so horrible because otherwise it would be so obvious that nobody would be as horrible as them. And, and I know that sounds almost too simple or something, but that really was it. It was like, wait a minute, how is it possible that every single person who we disagree with is a bigot and a racist and a Nazi and a homophobe, and we're just all so brilliant? Like, it wasn't, I wasn't that impressed with the people I was surrounded by. So I thought, this can't possibly be it. And that then led me down a path of talking to all sorts of different people from all different walks of life. And what I've come to believe is that in many cases, it's the progressives who are the least tolerant. It's the progressives who are actually the ones that are uh, instigating the most racism in society in a modern sense, uh, and who are the most authoritarian and, and totalitarian, while it's pretty much everybody else that's trying to figure out how to live and let live. Doesn't mean that they all do it perfectly, and I have certain criticisms of people on the right and conservatives and things like that, but there's broadly something brewing on the right, like a center right in America that I would say is sort of disaffected lefties, classical liberals, libertarians, conservatives, MAGA people, that is kind of bouncing around what I think are the right ideas for Western society to move forward. The left has just sort of gone off the deep end. So I, if we have to view things in a, in a sort of polar way, I would say if, that's, if those are the two choices, I see some richness and fertile ground here and I see pretty much scorched earth over here. Well, that, that gets to a question I like to ask people, which is, so it sounds like you already um, had a kind of distinction in your mind. You saw yourself a little separate from, you know, the, the progressive left pretty early on, even if you saw, us, you saw them in the same kind of general atmosphere of you. And what, what would have been in, in those days your, your impression of why people disagreed with you? So if, if you eventually saw it, yeah, I can't put it all down to just evil. Um, what would have been your take as to why everybody didn't agree with the way you saw the world? Yeah, it's interesting. It's a good question. I mean, you know, partly my wiring is not that hot-headed, as you can probably tell. I think that's probably why I'm a decent interviewer. So, so I don't get that upset when people say things. So one of the things that I noticed was if anyone on the right said almost anything, they just said something about taxes. If they said, we want to lower taxes, they'd say, you're racist and you're because you don't want to help poor people. And if you don't want to help poor people, you don't want to help black people. And if you don't want to help black people, you're racist. And they'd be screaming about it all the time. And I think my uh, temperament never lent itself to that. So even when I was in the midst of being at the Young Turks doing this stuff on a daily basis, you can't find videos of me screaming really or getting overly emotional and all that. And by the way, you know, this isn't a real secret of the trade, but you know, a lot of these same people, they'd be screaming and screaming on camera. And then the second we take a break, it would be like, oh, checking my Twitter feed, putting makeup on and you know, what's going on, joking around. And then the camera turns on and you're screaming again. So a lot of it's just theater and acting and, and the rest sure. of it. Um, but as if your question really is like, what, what did I see as a difference with them originally? Is that really where you're going with this? Well, what, I, what I'm really trying to get is that I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what was it about the way that you were thinking before that made oh, you open to changing? And so one, one question would be, you know, if you saw it, 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 how you were thinking about the right, generally speaking, in those days, could, I'm very interested in okay, that gotcha. and how that played a role in how you started to move in a different direction. So this is what I would describe as factory settings, that most of us, if you grow up in public education in America, but not just education. You grow up culturally American with our TV and music and movies and all of these things. In many ways, you're just a default lefty. Like the memes that appear that we all just sort of accept as young people are sort of like Democrat good, Republican bad, liberals are for peace, conservatives are for war, you know, uh, lefties like um, poor people, Republicans, or people on the right like money, like these things that they all just sort of seep into you. And that's what I mean by factory settings. They just sort of get into you. And I think the clearest way I can answer your question actually is that if you don't think about these things at a really deep level, it kind of works. It just kind of works. So it's, I, I always, when I ever have to retweet Bernie Sanders and retweet him to 
explain why he's wrong, I mean, not to support him. Um, almost everything that Bernie Sanders says sounds right for about 10 seconds until you think about it. And then once you see the through the veneer, um, then you realize none of it makes sense. I mean, so an easy example, I know you'll be with me on this one, is $15 minimum wage. Now, Bernie has never run a business. I am a more successful small businessman than Bernie is or will ever be. I have actual employees. I pay all of their health insurance and benefits because I know that by treating my employees well, they'll treat me well, and that's how we'll grow the company, and it's, and it's pretty great. No one's forcing us to do any of that stuff. Bernie, who's never run a company, although he's run a campaign where people give him money, and then it was found out that he wasn't even paying his guys $15 an hour, so he ended up cutting their hours. Uh, he says $15 minimum wage. Now, he has no principle to stand on, I, but, but other than this sort of amorphous, I want to help poor people, something like that, right? I want a living wage. These are amorphous phrases that don't really mean anything. So he just says, I want $15 minimum wage. Now, the government, in my opinion, has no right to tell me as a small businessman how much I can or I have to pay my employees. I pay my guys really well, again, because I know that that then in turn will cause them to do better work and be more invested, and that's great for me too. So I would say that's rational self-interest, right? Now, Bernie says $15 minimum wage, and then what happens? Well, a week later, Rashida Tlaib, another progressive member of the squad or whatever you want to call it, she says $20 minimum wage. And it's like, oh, well, Bernie just made up a number to feel good about himself. So I guess her number's higher. She must feel even better about herself. And then what happens is the left, because the left views government as inherently good, even though they think half of the people that created the government are racists and bigots and evil creatures, they're always in, an, in, in a, uh, a game to out-government themselves. So it's like $15 minimum wage, $20 minimum wage. No, 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 no. Like someone will come around and say $35 minimum wage. And then Andrew Yang will come around and say, no, 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 UBI for everybody. Let's give everyone $1,000 a month because they all sort of view the government as somehow inherently good because I can't figure out what the, the unifying principle is on the left. If you were to just think about our democratic nomination process, which now seems like a lifetime ago, what's the, what's the real unifying principle that brings together Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg, Kamala Harris? It's like, well, they all really love government, right? Like they don't love freedom. They never say the word freedom. They never say the word liberty. They never talk about the constitution. Now on the right, it's different because although they don't live up to it all the time, it's very obvious that politicians on the right basically believe in the constitution. They basically believe in individual rights. That's a pretty good starting point. And then, you know, their policies may be wrong and foolish and spending and all of those things that we can get into, but there is sort of a bedrock beneath it of we believe in the Constitution and we believe in individual rights. On the left, I have no idea what the unifying principle is anymore other than government is good. And well, A, I don't think government is good, but B, that's not a, that's not a unifying principle. That's just a method to get you to a really authoritarian government. So I think I sort of answered your question there because the point is that it, it, it becomes something that by its own nature they believe to be true. Government is just good, so you just kind of accept it. And then when you tell them all the reasons that it's not, you have to be a bigot and a racist because they just feel it's kind of right. So I, th it's, I can definitely see sort of what, how you were perceiving, yeah, I don't want to be like these people. Um, but you know, the, you could have just like said, look, I, I have the views that I hold and I <laughs> regard these people as kind of off their rocker. They shouldn't be in our camp of, you know, the left or liberals. Um, but I think you also evolved to be, at least on some issues, more open ideas that oh, yeah. either traditionally conservatives or libertarians have made. What about those arguments appealed to you uh, to the extent that they did? Yeah, that's a good question because, you know, you can find videos when I first started talking about this stuff. I was waving my hands, guys, guys, I'm part of the left. I'm a lefty. Let's fix this thing from within. Let's start respecting free speech again. Let's not mob speakers. Let's not deplatform people, all of those things. And I kept saying it as a lefty. And then you may have seen that video that I did for PragerU, Why I Left the Left, and it got something like 20 million views. And I never had said that I left the left. I didn't know, I never said that in the script of the video. And I actually, that morning when I woke up, I saw the push notification on my phone and I was like, oh 
this is terrible <laughs> because because people I felt always like, think you write your own headlines and you, yeah, you very seldom do you you very seldom do but i thought in many ways they were pulling the rug out under me because it was like hey no i am a lefty and and i'm trying to fight for liberalism what i realized within an hour was that the reaction to it was so overwhelming from former lefties that it felt to me that it was going to be okay i, I didn't want to you know bother calling them to, to switch the title or something like that. Um, but what happened was, you know, I started from that video then, started talking to some scary people on the right. I talked to the scary Dennis Prager. I talked to the scary uh, Glenn Beck. Uh, I think I had already talked to Yaron Brook. I had already talked to Ben Shapiro. But I, it started widening my lens of who I was willing to talk, not, not who I was willing to talk to, I always would have been willing to talk to them. It started widening my lens of who was gonna to talk to me, I suppose. And as I talked to these people, I found them to be thoughtful, I found them all to be pleasant and more than happy to agree to disagree. I also found that they really knew what their arguments were, as opposed to what I find on the left, which is they don't, again, they don't really know why they believe something, they just kind of feel it's right. They just kind of feel that I just, I care about poor people, so I wanna give them money. Like, because they don't really want to think about the underlying issues or, or the second and third order effects that happen where, okay, we're going to give all this welfare and then show me, has welfare ever helped? Or does it keep people in perpetual poverty? Well, we know that the answer is the latter, but they don't really want to think about that. They want the easy answer, which is let's just take money from someone else and give it to those poor people. What I found on the right was they were much more willing to explain why they believe what they believe and how they came to their conclusion. And that was very attractive to me because that should be attractive to any of us that, that are thinking, right? Like if, if you can sit down with someone and go, whoa, you actually know why you think something, you've actually thought out all the things that I might ask you about, um, and you're willing to agree to disagree, uh, that, that's a pretty beautiful thing. So I would say the one thing that I really have shifted on, because most of my underlying principles, I would say are the same that they've always been, the one thing that I really have shifted on is, is uh, on the right is economics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you sit down long enough with Thomas Sowell, you sit down with Yaron Brook from ARI, you sit down with some really interesting libertarian uh, economists, and I see no way that you won't shift right economically. And on top of everything else, you know, in the midst of this, as my success grew, my business was growing, and I'm here in California and LA where our property taxes and every other tax is through the roof and I know as I now write my bananas check every year to the government, it's like, man, if you guys lowered my taxes, um, I, it's not that I would buy a yacht, although I would perfectly be within my right to buy a yacht if I could afford it, I would be hiring more people. So the more you guys increase my taxes, you actually hurt the economy. And we know this to be true because look what's happening right now with coronavirus. It's like, what two states are flourishing beyond imagination right now? It's Florida and Texas that have zero income tax. And what two states are absolutely struggling? It's New York and California, which have progressive authoritarian regimes, I would say. Uh, and we have, I think, what's our prop our income tax is thirteen percent, and New York is eight, something like that. And yet we're well, the ones in we're the ones in debt, and they've got balanced budgets. So there yeah, you go. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I I ended up fleeing California a few months after after our interview, and then I got mad at you because it wasn't too long after that that you went and did stand up at the Irvine Improv, which it <laughs> broke my that, heart. To miss. That was my that was my comeback show. It was actually one of the best shows that I've ever had. I, I will pat myself on the back for one moment, but the manager said, that's one of the biggest comedy clubs in the country. It's about 500 seats. And the manager, who's been working there for about 20 years, she said it was the first ever sold out standing ovation she had ever seen. Yeah, and really, I just, mess, I just mess around with the crowd. I get up there and I'm just having fun. I'm like running a circus more than a stand up show. So another, we'll, we'll do it eventually. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> Once there's a little bit more freedom in the country, uh, yes, yes, I, I, I assume I'll we'll have to wait for that. I wonder to what extent, though, did you encounter um, one thing I've seen with people kind of in the middle of a transition in their ideas is that you know the side that they're kind of moving the direction to almost smells blood in the water, and they like want to like you know claim them as their own, and yeah. uh, y you can start to almost feel like a prop or people want to turn you into a prop. To what extent did you run into that? And, and how did you think about that and cope with any, any of those dynamics? Yeah, you know, it was something that I thought about throughout the process. And even, even now, as it stands, I still do think about that at some level. There is some use, let's say, to the, for the people on the right 
to have a former lefty like me around, somebody that you know holds some what are thought of as traditional lefty beliefs, although most of my what's thought of as lefty beliefs you could explain through a libertarian lens anyway. So, um, you know, like marriage, for example, it's like, all right, well, just get the government out and then you can marry whoever you want. So, so be it. That's thought of as a lefty thing, but in many ways, I like the libertarian argument about it much better that just get the government out of it altogether. Um, I can't say that I never thought about it because I did. And as I said, I still do think about it at some level. What I can tell you is I am confident in my beliefs. And when I debate gay marriage, let's say with Ben Shapiro, who takes a traditional religious position on it, um, or I debate the death penalty with Dennis Prager, he's for the death penalty, I'm against it. That's a pretty conservative, you know, conservatives generally are for it. Liberals are definitely against it. Uh, even when I've deba debated belief and morality with some people, um, I just did with, uh, with Amy Peacock, by the way, on her podcast. And we, we, we've come to sort of different conclusions at some level on this stuff. I'm confident enough of my beliefs that I don't think that they're somehow pulling the wool over my eyes or something like that. But I will grant you this, which is, you know, when you get sort of abused by one side, so like here I am going, hey, lefties, let's let's act more liberally, let's be decent. And then all I get is hate, right? And even now, all I get from the left is just endless hate, endless, endless hate. Then you go to a new guy, you go, it's like you meet a na new neighbor, right? And they invite you into their home and they're being real nice to you. And, and over the course of the evening at dinner, you might realize you disagree with them on a few things, but you're not going to attack them over it. You're not going to storm out of the house. You're not going to tar and feather them. So what I've found is the more that I've been open-minded to their ideas, I think the more they've been open-minded to my ideas. So when people say, Dave, you're a tool of the right or something like that. Well, if I tell you the amount of Christian conservatives who've emailed me who say, you know, Dave, I never found a, a, a New York liberal who treated me decently and you've, you know, I've changed my position on gay marriage or whatever it might be. It's like, well, maybe I'm using them to the same level. I don't mean that to sound as cynical as it is, obviously, because that is not my intention and I don't think it's their intention. But I do think when you move from one thing to the other, um, you might be a little more accommodating of some of the messy stuff on the new side where you know the other stuff so much. So, you know, people will be critical of me. Dave, you're still always attacking the left. Well, it's like, I know what that freaking dangerous thing is. And what I have found is I've been able... I, I think I'm one of the people that's been able to help the right actually be a little more of what it's supposed to be. And I'm very proud of that, actually. Well, say, say more about that, because that, that's really interesting. What, what are the areas where you feel like I, I can make a real contribution to moving some people on the right in a better direction? So I think one of the things that the right is really grappling with right now, and by the way, doing it quite well, is you've probably seen some of this on Twitter, where there's the more traditional... Uh, religious conservatives, and then there's sort of the more libertarian camp. Now, I, I'm pretty sure that you and I fall into the, the libertarian side of this, where we would just always try to find ways that government doesn't have to be in things, where the, cons the traditional conservative types, you know, these are the people that want to like make porn illegal and jail pornographers and, and things like that. Now, I don't want to have a whole debate over porn. My personal preference, I'm not going to sit here pretending <laughs> I've never watched porn, right? So, so, but the point is that their, their argument really is that, oh, these things, they, they infect society over generations and then it comes with crime and drugs and da, da, da. And that then harms the family and the family is the foundation of what a successful society is. I'm actually sympathetic to that argument. I don't think that argument is completely wrong. My belief, and this is where I think the future of conservatism will be, will be the more libertarian side of it, which, which is, yes, let's strengthen the family however we can, but ultimately that is up to the individual. The state can have some sort of, I don't even want to say guidelines or laws, but the state can do things to sort of help the family flourish, um, but the family may not look exactly as you religious conservatives always wanted it to look. There, there's going to be interracial families, obviously. I, I don't really sense conservatives that bothering them. But there are going to be gay families, which, you know, let's say the, the more religious conservatives aren't that thrilled with. So I think what, what my, I think this is actually uh, probably going to be mostly what my second book is about. I think what my job will be in many ways is to help strengthen that libertarian side of conservatism. Um, and, and keep showing them that individual choice is the most important thing. And 
by the way, that, that debate is happening on the right. Um, you may have remembered from Twitter, there was that Sorab Armani, is, is his last name, uh, debate with uh, David French. And, and he takes, right. Sorab takes the, you know, let's jail pornographer. Matt Walsh was involved in this too. Um, not necessarily let's jail them, but, you know, po- you know we've got to make porn illegal versus the more libertarian side, which is generally you just have to let people do the messy things in life that they do. Um, I think I think that's a I don't mean to just make this specifically about porn, but these sort of like institutional or not institutional, these sort of like timeless issues about morality and all of these things that the conservatives will have to always debate between a sort of morality side and an individual liberty side. And I like the individual liberty side and I think I can do some good work there. What do you think people, uh, you know, who are pro liberty should know about progressives in order to better appeal to people who were like you on the left? Man, I mean, that's tough. I, I would say mostly it's that they've come to their conclusions in most cases because they just, because their feelings almost override everything else with them. That really is it. When I have been able to help, you know, de-brainwash lefties, Many of them just say, oh, I just kind of accepted it as true. It just sort of felt right. It sounded right. I want to help. Because again, this goes to where liberals are thought of as nice. Liberals are open-minded. Liberals want to help poor people. Uh, But it's all the the policies that they implement that are wrong. It's, It's, you know, and the road to hell, of course, is paved with good intentions. So I would say for people on the right, if you're trying to wake up lefties, well, what I always tell college students, because I get some version of this question all the time, is um, is first be a little bit better than they are. And, and what that means is don't be as hysterical as them. Don't be as overly emotional as them. Don't be as quick to judge and quick to destroy and silence and all those things. Now, generally, people on the right are better about that as a, as a blanket rule. But, but do a little bit of that. You know, don't be a pushover, but do, do turn the other cheek. Don't let them run the car over you, but, you know, give them a little room to operate. Um, but then really try... You know, the other thing that you can do is make it as personal as possible. What I find is when people on the left say a lot of the things that, oh, Republicans are all racist, conservatives are all bigots, they're the Nazis. Are the... Well, if you're on the right and you're talking to your friend or you're a conservative, whatever it is, and you're talking to your friend who's a lefty and they're saying all those things, so, so you're saying you think I'm, I'm racist? What, what have I said that's racist? Have you ever seen me do anything racist in my life? Have you ever seen me do anything homophobic in my life? Have I ever expressed hatred to a group because of an immutable characteristics? Uh, immutable characteristic? I think you can, you can personalize it in a way that if you can get them to see you as a human, well, then the next thought that they'll have is, whoa, maybe I did get a bunch of other things wrong too because my friend, my brother, he, he's not evil. And now that I see that, well, then suddenly the rest of the stuff can start melting away. Uh, yeah, that makes a, lo- a lot of sense. I mean, the, I, I definitely found that often the first thing that allows people to question their framework is they meet somebody they admire or respect with a different framework. And so, like, you know, I come from a background of, you know, the, the subculture of objectivists who I think in many ways have, uh, have been unfairly tarnished, but in some ways fairly tarnished with, you know, being weird or doctrinaire or, you know, dogmatic and things. And so there'll, there'll be a lot of preconceptions about how we'll be. And then to the extent I've been successful in persuading people in real life, it's almost always starts with just the fact of, oh, you're not how I would expect you to be. Um, and, and you can get a long way with just being a thoughtful person who's, um, does not kind of reinforce really bad stereotypes of your view. I I think that's probably the best way to do it, which of course is very congruent with uh, objectivism because you're basically saying focus on the individual. So I think that 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 makes sense. You know, the interesting thing with objectivists is that, you know, you know, I've been to a gajillion objectivist conferences and talked at all sorts of things and done plenty of events with Yaron Brook and all that. And I find objectivists almost without exclusion, to be thoughtful and interesting and actually fun and, yeah, kind of nerdy too, but I'm kind of nerdy. I could talk about Star Wars all day long. I I don't care about any of that stuff. I find them to be serious about ideas and they like thinking about things honestly and seriously and all that. Um, I think 
that objectivists have been treated unfairly because it is a pretty cohesive set of views. And that is in many ways the most dangerous thing to ideologues. If you're just an ideologue, right or left, if someone comes to you with a pretty cohesive set of views, I think that that is, uh, that's, their, that's the scariest thing for them. Uh, because, you, because you're coming mm. at something full, not just, oh, I have to get this narrow worldview across. I think where objectivists have struggled, um, because people used to say to me, Dave, you know, why, aren't you, why don't you call yourself an objectivist? And I always used to say, well, look, I, I call myself a liberal. I'm trying to save the word liberal. Like, I, I just don't need another uh, label, <laughs> label associated with me. Um, and I also think we're, we're moving into a place that will be sort of post labels in many ways, because all of the labels will feel too, too strict in a lot of ways. But I think, and, and I got into this pretty extensively with, with Amy Peacock, I think the reason objectivism never, never got to where perhaps it should have gotten uh, or never sort of crossed that canyon, I think actually has more to do with the question of belief than anything else. I, I think the, the, the really anti-religious part of objectivism, almost viewing it as like some sort of serious human flaw or something like that, I, I think that falls flat at a societal level, not at an individual level. And, and that, uh, I think there may be reasons for that. But at an individual level, I think, of course, you can be moral and decent and good as a, as a non-believer. Of course you can. I mean, half my books here are from Sam Harris and Michael Shermer and Peter Bogosian and, and, and Yaron and you, and, and you can be a non-believer. I don't think a society can organize around something about around non-belief. I think it needs something bigger than itself to organize around, which I know Ayn Rand would call art and, and all of these other things. I just don't think that stuff is enough. And I think that that's why objectivism hasn't sort of taken the world sort of fully as maybe Ayn Rand or uh, an objectivist would want. That's, no, slight, that's a slight sidebar, but I think that no, that I'm, is sort of it. I, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because I mean, part of my view is uh, it's very easy to come up with explanations for why your your arguments or your views aren't more popular than you'd wish that put the onus on other people. And that can, you know, feel kind of nice to pat yourself on the back, but it should also be really depressing, which is if you're doing everything perfectly and and you're completely unpopular, then you're out of the driver's seat. Like you basically just have to accept things as they are. Whereas if you take the onus on yourself that like, what can we do to be clear? You know, how do we address an argument like the one you put forward? Like, do we have a real answer to that? Then we have the opportunity to be better. And so like, I think that kind of, you know, friendly criticism and questioning is important for like you to make, for us to hear. And, you know, it goes to, I think the heart of why you do what you do, which is you think those are exactly the kinds of conversations all of us need to be having. And I mean, you've talked now to, I mean, I don't know if you even have a number on it, but a lot of really interesting people, a lot of very influential people. In fact, when, when we talked, you had just recently interviewed Jordan, Jordan Peterson for the first time. And you, you oh, did it over Skype at that ago. point. And I, I remember your reaction was like, well, what do you think of him? Cause you, you, you weren't quite sure. Cause you, you yeah. hadn't sat in the same room with him. It was only, you know, a 40 minute interview or whatever. You guys went on to become very close, but you've had a lot of guests of that stature all the way down to, you know, me. And <laughs> um, I'm curious if you have a view of the, the people you've talked to, the ones who have become really prominent and influential versus the ones who, you know, they're just doing their thing out there, but it, uh, you know, it hasn't added up to really making an impact. What are the qualities you see that jump out as like, you know, these are the traits I would recommend a young person to cultivate if they wanted to be, you know, like a Sam Harris or like a Jordan in terms of really reaching people, really connecting with them. So I think Jordan's the best example of this and, and he's the best example. And in many ways, he's almost the worst example because people think of him as something other than human in a lot of cases. And I always tell people, you know, he's just a guy. He, he's just a guy. He's, is, has, he, has he brought something forth to the world that is incredible and actually changed the world because he changed people's lives? Yes, but he's just a man. Um, but, I, but it's funny that you remember that because I moved in here in November of 2016. So I must have interviewed you very shortly after that because he was in the, the, first, the reason I did it over Google Hangout was because we didn't, our studio was being built. We, our, our internet connection wasn't great. I did this Google Hangout with him. It's very pixelated. The audio was going in and out. And, you know, he's talking and he moves his hands a lot and he says a lot of words that, you know, and a lot of references and, and literary things. And you have to kind of play catch up the whole time. 
And at the end of the interview, he's telling a story that he's told many times about Pinocchio and, and looking for the star. Uh, and, um, and he started crying. And I remember when I closed my computer, uh, I turned to my guys and I was like, that was either the most brilliant man I've ever talked to, or he's completely insane. I don't know. And what I quickly found out over the course of the next year, where then we met in person many times, and I, I did several speaking events with him, um, and I, you know, we, I interviewed him in here and, and a whole bunch, of, and then ended up being on tour with him for a year and a half. I think a guy like him, what he has um, is that he's not just saying something to sell a book. He was 12 Rules for Life, if you read that book, in, the, the, in essence, the message is, what, what, what was the meme that caught on more than anything else? Clean your room. Meaning clean your room before you clean the world, that you have things that you have to fix in your life. We all have these things. We all know we have them. Our subconscious is always talking to us throughout the day. When you're doing something right, it's pretty quiet. When you're doing something wrong, it's usually telling you you're doing something wrong. Um, but he was, in essence, telling people to fix themselves, then go fix the world. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. Don't lie. These are things that we all know. And I think he did everything he could to not only put the ideas forth, but to put that forth in the world. He also showed, showed vulnerability because he could cry you know, while talking about something. He showed strength by being brave and standing up to the mob. I think he showed a cohesive worldview and then showed a person behind it that, that lived up to those things. Now, again, it's not to say he's not perfect and he's had some, some struggles since then, which by the way, just to clear it up, uh, you know, people think he was suddenly like taking uh, these prescription drugs out of nowhere like an addict. He was fully open about taking them. He would talk about it on stage. Then his wife was diagnosed with what they thought was terminal cancer. And then he did up some of the dosage himself, which he, I know he regrets, obviously. <clears throat> but he will be fine and he'll, he'll be back probably in the fall. Um, but I think it, it was the combination of believing something and acting like it within the world acting is not quite the right word because it was, it was just being that way in the world more than anything else. And I think I've really tried to do the best I can with that. You, you don't do it perfectly all the time. You just don't. We all fall into our old traps. We all fumble along the way. But, but that, I think, is the basic idea. So I saw that with him more than anyone else. There are other people who I know that are great thinkers that are, that are you know, particularly knowledgeable about whatever their topic is, economics, history, sports, comedy, it doesn't matter, that they're very focused on that. What, what made Jordan transcendent was that it didn't matter what you care about. It didn't matter what your hobbies are or what your gender is or sexuality or, or skin color, or any of those things. His message was a human message and is a human message. And I thought, and I think people saw a man doing the best they could. And how often do we see that? We don't see that very often. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, one of the things, one of the things that took me a long time to achieve, you know, I've done a lot of public speaking and I think one of the most important things and, and Jordan does this as well as anybody, which is, you know, be yourself on stage so that you're the same person that you would meet, you know, backstage or in your living room. That is so hard to achieve. But part of why it's so important is because I think part of what he communicates and I think great speakers communicate is that they're there, they're connecting with the audience, and they actually care about what they're saying and they care about you getting that message. And if you're up there putting on an act, which is usually not malintended, but it's you're nervous, you're, yeah. you're scared, you don't want to make a fool of yourself, which Lord knows I sympathize with that, but it disconnects you and you, you just lose all of that. And it takes a real, I mean, it takes practice. And I think it takes a lot of courage, but I think it's it's a, people are always looking for the tactic, right? Like, how do I come up with the killer story or like follow the uh, TED Talk, you know, guidelines? Um, and I think so much of it is just how do you really be who you are in a context that makes that extremely difficult? And, and think about how consistent what you're saying is, is with his message of be your, in essence, his message is be yourself, which is the most important thing we all know. It doesn't mean give in to every one of your impulses at any moment, but be your best holistic full self as well as you can, knowing that you're going to fail at it sometimes. One of the coolest things that I got to see when we were on tour, and we did about 120 stops in about 20 countries, and Jordan would talk about this sometimes, but then I saw him actually do it. He would talk about how when his kids were growing up, they had a tree in front of the house. 
and that when his daughter was young, five, six, seven, eight years old, she'd be climbing the tree and he could see that she would try to get to a new branch, but then couldn't quite get there. But then three days later, she would stretch out her leg in a different way and eventually get there. Sometimes she would fall. Sometimes he would have to help a little assistance or point a certain way or whatever it is. And he would mention that story because he would talk about it within the way he was trying to uh, continue his intellectual pursuits. So I would see him on stage where he would talk about an idea sort of as far as he could on any given night. And then he would say, he would, I mean, he would literally do this. He would say, you know, I think I've said everything I can say about that tonight, um, but I'm going to keep thinking about it and I'll, I'll write a blog post about it or something. And then three shows later, I would see him do the same thing but go a little bit further with it and a little bit further with it and a little bit further with it. And that went throughout the tour. So when I tell you truly that the last, the last show that we did together was at um, the Sydney Opera House. So you can picture that amazing building in Sydney, Australia. It's right on the harbor. It was an absolutely stunningly gorgeous day. It was our only matinee show of the entire tour. Uh, Jordan actually continued a little further in Australia. I had to go home for some family commitments, but this is around 120 shows. I didn't know until we got there that day that the Sydney Opera House, it's a, it's a theater in the round in effect. It's, it's in a box, basically. So you have audience behind you, on both sides you and in front of you. Obviously, most theaters, you just have an audience in front of you. When you're getting laughs from every which direction, the feeling of that is, I, I can't describe it. There's, there's no human feeling that I have ever felt with substances or without that can, that can mimic that feeling. It was such a magical show. But I'm telling you that at that show, which was our last show together, um, he was better than he had been at any other show we had done. He was consistently getting better throughout the thing. I never saw the guy phone it in. And he would always say to me, Dave, if we're going to do this thing, we better give it everything we've got. And again, that sort of sounds cliche, but it's true. And I've tried to incorporate that even into this book tour that I'm doing. It's like, I said yes to virtually everything. If I'm going to sell a book and, and believe in the ideas that I've put forth in this thing, well, then I'm going to do every freaking thing I can to make sure as many people read this thing as possible. Well, let's end with building on that point, because I, I would really love to hear sort of what are you working on? Like, what are your ambitions to make, you know, the biggest impact that you want to make in the area you want to make it? What's kind of, where, where is your kind of horizon right now that you're aiming at? Well, I think the biggest and most important thing that I'm doing right now is that I started this tech company called Locals.com, which is to fight the encroachment of censorship that big tech is subjecting us to every day. We are not building a platform the way YouTube and Facebook and Twitter have built platforms. We're building digital homes for creators. So RubenReport.com is now part, it's the first project of Locals.com. We have hundreds, we have thousands of creators on there now and we're growing every day. Donald Trump Jr. just announced that he's going to be on there. Um, just this morning I saw, this is, uh, I can't say who it is, but a major senator uh, just signed up for an account. So I think we're making some real headroads. But what we're doing is not putting up a platform for everybody. If you want, as a creator, whatever you are, not just a political person, if you're a gamer or a knitter or an unboxer or you run a baseball league or a freaking nonprofit, whatever it might be, we all need to own our digital lives. So we're building digital communities for creators. So you own your video, you own your audio, you own the user data, we don't own it. If you leave us, you take all of that stuff. This is completely the reverse of how big tech operates right now. Um, you set your own rules in your community. So you know everyone says, oh, I want a free speech platform, but nobody really wants a free speech platform. They say it and then they don't realize what that is. Um, so we said, okay, well, I'll treat it like I treat my house. I am completely fine with anyone's free speech outside of my house, but I don't invite everyone into my house to, to yell at me and, and say awful things about me. So if, if someone comes into your community that is against whatever rules you've set up in your community, you can boot them, but you're not deplatforming them because they can still be in anyone else's locals. So we've really, I think, built what a system that has solved 95% of the problems for 95% of the creators. I think the big tech censorship problem is probably the most important uh, issue of our time. In many ways, it's far bigger than coronavirus, actually. Um, and I think that will be the thing that will probably be the biggest thing that I do. But in terms of, in terms of this, all the stuff we've been talking about, um, 
it's what I said earlier. I want now, as someone that is of the right, whatever that means, I, I want to help that movement, which I think has, has gotten the big stuff right. The, the big stuff is right on the right. I want to help them not lose liberty in the midst of all this. So even this morning, actually, Trump tweeted something uh, basically about regulating big tech. I don't want to regulate big tech. So I retweeted him and I, I added my commentary, which was, you know, you don't want to take big tech and add it to big government because now you just got something bigger and, and worse. Uh, I look forward to having you on locals.com, Mr. President, something like that. And it's like, that's how we'll solve things. Uh, you know, we can't just throw out our, I see a lot of conservatives right now and even some libertarians like, yeah, now is when we have to regulate. And it's like, I get that impulse. I get it. And I'm not even saying I'm totally right on this, but I, I would much rather fall back on human ingenuity and the mind and the individual to solve things. You know, there used, there were tons of companies throughout the generations that everyone thought were monopolies that would exist forever and that don't exist anymore. And the same thing will be true of YouTube and Google and the rest of them. Yeah, I mean, I saw your tweet and I was really happy you made it because my first thought is, okay, so when President AOC comes in and now she gets to decide what bias is, uh, I think you and I, would be, you, you and I would be in for a, a very rude awakening. And by the way, when I say that the, the left generally you know, does uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, I think this is a place where the right ha- much of the right has a little bit of a blind spot, which is, yes, Trump may be sympathetic to your free speech stuff, but now you're going to combine it. Now let's say Trump loses in three months. Congratulations, we've got President Elizabeth Warren, because I don't think Biden's even going to make it that far. Uh, but even if it was Biden, you, now you've, got, you've combined big tech with leftist government people. How do you think that's going to work out for you? So I got a lot of hate today, or I'm getting a lot of hate today from conservatives on Twitter, but I think that I, I've stuck to my principles. And it's not just something I'm talking about. I'm actually building something to, to solve some of the problems. Well, this is a lot of fun, Dave. Good luck in everything. It was great talking to you. It was good talking to you. Good luck. You're a fine interviewer. And uh, if I need a guest host one day, maybe I'll call you. 